Next, we'll be hearing from Nancy Marie Mythlo. She is Fort Sill Chiricahua Apache and a professor of gender studies and American Indian studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. M professor Mythlo's curatorial work has resulted in nine exhibits at the Venice Biennial. A lifelong educator, she has taught at the University of New Mexico, the Institute, the Institute of American Indian Arts, the Santa Fe Community College, Smith College, California Institute of the Arts, Occidental College, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And here's her very big news. Her co-edited 2022 book, Visualizing Genocide, Indigenous Interventions in Art, Archives, and Museums, was published by the University of Arizona Press in the last few days. Big news. Welcome, Nancy. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Liza, for that warm introduction. And uh, thanks to the organizers, to the other panelists, uh, to our audience. I'm really grateful and honored to be here. Um, like many of the speakers, I'm going to be sharing a labor of love that is not my own individually. Uh, this belongs to a lot of people. So you'll see in the first slide, I note the authors and the artists who are involved in this project. And I have to give a special shout out to my co-editor, Yves Chavez, who's Tongva. This is her territory. She took a job this fall at the University of Oklahoma in Norman, Oklahoma, so I couldn't be more excited for her. This came out of a conference presentation at the College Art Association. I think it was 2018. At that time, um, you know, I'm always kind of wary of first. Uh, you, you probably are familiar with the scholarship on firsting and lasting, Gene O'Brien. Um, it's a colonial move to say you're first, uh, but we understand that that was the first all native women's panel at the College Art Association. So we were, we, we had fun. We were proud of ourselves. Um, I want to say something really quick about some, you know, general themes. So what I've heard this morning and that really resonates with me is this idea of trauma being individualizing. And I wanted to share on Sunday, I, I mentioned briefly, my, my tribe is known primarily for our status as being prisoners of war for 28 years, from 1886 to 1913. So my grandfather, who was alive when I got my dissertation finished at Stanford University, was born in this country as a prisoner of war. I don't even like using that frame. I know we're getting into semantics during this conference, but now I say political prisoners indefinitely detained because his only crime was being born at a place called Fort Marion in Florida. So I'm, I'm gonna kind of speak to that, but I, I like that theme and I'm really resonating with this idea of violence as really representing state sponsored structural harms and, and how empowering that is. So, so thank you for allowing me to kind of engage in that frame. Okay, so this project for myself, this chapter that I wrote for the book, really started out of my role as an educator. And I knew that my students could understand visual language for some icons in American history. And I knew that this wonderful image of Martin Luther King Jr. in the Birmingham jail, I could flash this and they understood it immediately. They comprehended it. They knew what it stood for. It stood for the civil rights movement. It, it, it stood for so many things, right? But if I, if I flash this next image, no one knew what this was, right? You know, this was an unmarked image in the majority of my students' minds. And so we, we all know this image here, American Indian scholars know this image of spotted elk called Bigfoot. Um, this was kind of a, a war crime, just the taking of the photograph. And if you look at my chapter, I kind of document kind of the, the side show circus inhumane treatment um, at this time in our, in our past. So I wanted to see what do artists do with these stories? I, I've been very fortunate to work with Jim Logan. He headed up the, Indigenous Arts at the Canada Arts Council for many years. We did projects in Venice together at the Biennale. Um, great guy. And, and I wanted to kind of start with, well, how do artists then in their way address these things? And we've used art a lot in this conference. Um, and I just got to say, I'm a real stickler for lots of things in art, guys. 
and, and I am with my students and, and I've got a former student in the audience. And so she'll know, I mean, I don't like it when people put text on top of artwork. I don't like it when artwork is not named. I don't like it when people in photographs are not named. So I wasn't trained as an art historian. I was trained as a cultural anthropologist, a visual anthropologist, primarily because they had all our stuff in the museums and that's where I wanted to be. Um, but it's not, it doesn't come from an art history thing. It, it comes from me wanting deeply to understand how communities react to harm. And this creative impulse, and, and thank you so much for sharing this morning um, about the legacy project of using artwork instead of just verbal testimony. I think this is part of what I'm talking about here. Artwork is not just communicative. I think it is a form of us embodying dignity. Um, and, and so I, I like that space and, and that's what I'm just gonna be talking about. So one thing that I did with this project is I chose three artists that were responding at three different times in history. And the first of these is, is Jim Logan's and I'm calling this aesthetic dialogue. So, so Jim was going to art school. He was upset because there wasn't anything from his community in those books. And he noticed that this Benjamin West was everywhere. Um, you know, this is basically a very complicated trope with many signifiers, and you can probably see our indigenous man on the front as a spectator. And, and so he thought, I'm going to play with this, and I'm calling this an aesthetic dialogue, right? So he's taking this beloved portrait of everything that stands for imperialism and colonialism, and he's juxtaposing the horrors of the massacre at Wounded Knee because he knows that this kind of reference point is one that the majority culture engages in. So, so what do you call this? How do you name this? How do you move within this? This, this is kind of my curiosity and what I was doing with this paper is he's basically regaining that dignity that was lost in the photographic process, right? This is a beloved elder. And you'll note that the native man is substituted with a Canadian uh, force. There's another project that I, I wanted to share with you. This one comes um, from basically the commemoration of St. Augustine, Florida. This is the same place that I, I, I shared where my grandfather was born and where we were held as prisoners of war. This is in 2018. Um, this is called Rewriting History. Ledger art is a whole package. I could talk about this art form for a long time, but this is a group of indigenous artists that invited 78 artists to respond to the 400 year legacy of this physical place called St. Augustine, Florida. And I chose to kind of move in on, on one story within this and it's a boarding school story. Let me tell you one of my kind of mm, anti slaps is when I get really upset about how the Carlisle image and in particular this image is used as a signpost because it's again, kind of a, a horrific image and we've, we've used it without giving kind of proper weight, I think, uh, to what's going on in this, this, this picture. And, and you guys know this photograph, 1884. So I darkened this purposely. And I, I wanted to share this artwork and kind of how I move with this, this physical evidence. So our people, Chiricahua Apache people, we were really overrepresented in the graves of the children there. We are overrepresented in the graves because we went from Fort Marion, Florida, where we were held as prisoners of war to Carlisle. So this is a very particular story for myself. This is a piece by Norman Akers and I'm calling this direct reproduction. I could talk for hours on each of these artworks. So I'm just gonna do really quickly and, and, and tell you, encourage you to get the book or I can share the chapter with you. Just you know, reach out to me if you wanna know more. So again, this is a reclamation project where hearts are put on the children and all of the kind of the white cities are whited out and you can see this sort of like handwritten directions that Norman Akers has done. Um, so, of course, this represents a famous time in history. I talk a lot about before and after in my scholarship. And what I've done here is to be very careful to name these children, right? These, these are individuals. And they're, they're, they're things that you can do very simply. And what I've done very simply with this physical evidence is I've just gone closer on these two girls because I want to know about Beatrice and Jeanette. I wanna know their story. It's not hard to do this for us. This is a very easy impulse. You know, Anyone who engages in the arts or museums can do this. And then to kind of say, okay, where should our children be ideally? They should be in their grandma's lap, smiling and laughing, right? So this is my own form of kind of resurrection with photographs. 
Um, the last artist that I wanted to address in this book, it's Tom Jones, and I call this reverse ethnography. Uh, Tom Jones is Ho-Chunk. He's known primarily as a, a portrait artist. I, I would call him that. Uh, Tom, if you're listening, don't be mad at me. Tom and I have done a lot of projects together. I taught with him for many years. This is a series called Sweet Land of Liberty, uh, Dear America of the I Sing. And it's kind of a collage project. Um, he likes to collect uh, photographs. This is a, an, a photograph, historic photograph of his community that he collected. And as you can see, the Ho-Chunk people are looking directly at the camera. This is sort of a, a, a non-native everyman um, in the corner. Part of a larger piece, um, I think the Minneapolis Institute for the Arts has purchased the whole piece. So um, I, I wanted to end uh, with my dad, a boarding school survivor. Um, I've come up with kind of this, this genealogy thing of how we were, what, let me see, survivors followed by my dad's generation, strivers. My generation, I'm calling us achievers, right? We really dig in, we get the stuff done. And I'm trying to think what the next generation is. And I was so inspired by the young people that opened this conference. I'm calling it believers, believers. So um, I'm gonna end there. Thank you for letting me share the work and to celebrate this work that really, I mean, I gotta tell you, it was a team effort and I'm really pleased that we were able to get these resources out there. Um, I hope that you're able to, to read the book and uh, please reach out to me if you have any further questions. Thank you.